Uh, okay. Um, MC asks, uh, do you enjoy watching films? If so, what are some of your favourites? I don't watch a lot of films these days. Uh, the reason is that films generally just last too long um, for, for, for my purposes. Um, so usually when I watch stuff, it's when I'm eating dinner. And, uh, you know, I, I, like I'll, I'll get my dinner, sit down, and I'll put something on to watch. And usually, you know, I, it takes me about like four... So there's a process where like, I eat the dinner and then I kind of digest it and I sort of kind of just sit with it, sort of feeling good after eating. Um, and, and that process usually lasts... Uh, that whole process usually lasts about 45 minutes to an hour. So after I eat a meal, you know, I sit with it for a little while. And then that takes like, I don't know, I have this nice feeling afterwards where I'm like, hmm, I'm satiated. Um, and it's usually kind of 45 minutes to an hour, depending on whether I have dessert. Um, and the point is films. So when I'm, the, when I'm sitting down and watching something, it's when I'm doing that. And, you know, a t and now a television episode is sort of ideal, but a film is too long. Um, so I don't really watch a lot of films these days. Um, but, you know, no, I do. I mean, I like films. Um, and um, I just don't watch so many these days. But I have seen plenty of films that I like. Um, some of my, fa I mean, my favourite film is 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, some other favourites, I'm, I really love uh, Werner Herzog. Uh, so Fata Morgana, Aguirre Wrath of God. Uh, Heart of Glass, The Wild Blue Yonder, those are some favourites. Um, I like a lot of the films of Peter Weir, um, but particularly Picnic at Hanging Rock and The Last Wave. Um, those those two in particular, I think, are very impressive. Um, Terminator, the Terminator movies. Um, uh, I mean, Terminator 1 and 2. I, there's a whole bunch of Terminator movies now, isn't there? But specifically Terminator 1 and 2, they're among my favourites. I mean, I guess I should say Arnold Schwarzenegger in general. Um, you know, I I mean, like the, the 80s and, and like early 90s Schwarzenegger movies are, um, you know, that's, that's just as good as it gets for me. Uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, I, what else do I like? Uh, Wallace and Gromit. I love Wallace and Gromit. I'd put those uh, very high on my list. Um, I like some sort of some like low budget kind of exploitation style movies, like some of the Troma films. I'm particularly Tromeo and Juliet. Um, that's that's definitely in my top ten. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Della Morte Della More, uh, or Cemetery Man, as it's called in the U.S. But I mean, Della Morte Della More is obviously a much better title. So those are some movies I like. Um, okay, where are we? Metalhead. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not answering that question because uh, otherwise I won't be able to put... Uh, there's another question there which I'm going to skip because uh, I, otherwise YouTube's advertising won't like it. Um, momentum. What's your secret to making such good titles that appeal to a general audience, even though the contents may be, may be niche? You know what? I had absolutely no idea that I was doing that. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what my secret is. Um, uh, do I appeal to a general audience? Uh, I mean, I feel like maybe I just appeal to people who are into philosophy. If I do appeal to a general audience, that's wonderful. But um, I, I guess I didn't realize. I mean, look, my channel isn't that big, right? <laughs> um, Muba. For the age ranges of 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on, what are the synesthetic images, colours, scenery that comes up in your mind? I mean, I don't get any images or colours for ages. Um, I don't really think of anything in particular when I think of an age. When I think of, like, the 20s as an age, as an age range, I guess if I think of anything, I just think of like, I don't know, people who look like they might be in their 20s, and that's about it. Um, you ask if I have aphantasia. Um, no, I did wonder that for a while, actually, because I, I don't have, like, very good mental imagery. Um, it's not... Like, my capacity for mental imagery is quite limited, I think, uh, at least relative to the norm. But I... No, I, I, I do have mental images, definitely. I'm, I'm really sure about that, um, that there's something going on inside. Um, so, it, it, yeah, but, but not probably, I, 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 it takes like quite a lot of work for me to kind of hold images in my mind and, um, and they, they're not very detailed. Um, 
So, uh, there's some, there's a long question here about subjective time dilation. Um, we seem to, we don't seem to experience subjective time dilation prospectively, but only retrospectively, which means that if you pack a lot of memory into one minute, for example, that minute will feel longer. We don't seem to experience, I'm not sure what that's referring to. I mean, in, I suppose like in the, in the present moment, there's not, experience of time dilation but that's because the present moment is just this is just the present right um so yeah it is only when you kind of think back and th there's a sense of the passage of time that occurs as you go through different moments but in any given moment there's no i don't i wouldn't say that there's any like i mean i don't know is there any is there a sense of the passage of time in a given moment probably not um so um yeah, I'm just going to skip to the end of this question. Hang on, because uh, it's long. Um, when it comes to living a long life, no one really talks about subjective phenomenological time, even though it might be just as important as being healthy. Do you try to be mindful of slowing down your subjective time? What year was the shortest for you? Uh, no, I couldn't care less about slowing down subjective time. It's not something I really worry about. Um, the shortest year is always the most recent one. I think that the sense of the passage of time, I, I, I mean, look, people say this and um, it, it's a common trope that people say is that time speeds up as you get older. And that's absolutely what I've experienced. Um, and I'm now in the stage of my life where um, it, 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 time passes just so quickly that I, I mean, it's hard to even like, I mean, it's it's actually hard to express the difference that, um, you know, when I, I, at least when I think back to how it seemed when I was, you know, 16, I remember being 16 and thinking like, oh, things are sort of speed. I noticed at the age of 16, like things were sped up a bit relative to being a kid. But by now, you know, by this age, it's like, I think in terms of my subjective time, like I'm basically at the end of my life right now. Like this is pretty much, you know, because <laughs> like, it's going, you know, it's going like a hundred times faster, right? So like when I was a kid, it was just like, uh, it was endless, you know, like the first, the first 10 years just stretched out into an eternity. And um, now everything's, every year goes by in the blink of an eye. And um, uh, I mean, it really, it really does. It's just, stunning how quickly like the the change that, that, that's occurred how rapidly everything is uh going by now um like i can't believe i'm actually already 31 in fact i'm i'm closer to 32 now because you know i mean my birthday's in june um but my, my god like how the hell did that happen um yeah so i mean i'm pretty much this is like i'm on my deathbed um subjective in terms of subjective time um okay so you order something different instead of your usual. You end up regretting because it was garbage. Next time, do you order something new again or do you just order what you know you will definitely enjoy? Don't know. Um, <laughs> probably depends on my whim in the moment. Um, how much does it bother you when someone your age is more successful? Successful by your metric. Oh, it is utterly infuriating. It really is. Um, how, how do you heat up your room? I do not heat up my room. There's no heating, hence the gloves and the many layers. Um, how many languages can you speak? I speak only one language, English. How much of what you read is because you enjoy learning versus you feel like you need to learn? How much pressure do you feel? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I get that much enjoyment from what I do. I, I just sort of have a drive to do it. Um, I just feel this drive to do philosophy and um, and sometimes not philosophy. Sometimes I have a drive to read other things. But uh, I don't know if I would say it's necessarily enjoyable. Um, I, I, I have this drive and then when I do it, the drive is satisfied. Maybe there's some sort of enjoyment from that. Do you daydream a lot? Do you have brain fog? What do you daydream about? I don't think so. I don't think I daydream a lot. Um, I mean, I don't find myself lost in thought very often. Um, I've not, I, I very rarely have the experience of like, 
kind of like uh you know standing in a room and then being like oh i was you know i was just kind of thinking about this thing that that doesn't happen very much to me so i probably don't dream no, i don't daydream that much um <clears throat> have you ever felt imposter syndrome if yes when uh yes uh, i mean in academia just uh, constantly abs it's it's utterly crippling and it, it probably played a role actually in why i left academia um um it, you know it it's uh yeah i mean i i got i got that i got that shit real bad um do you like optimization do you spend time to optimize things in your day-to-day -day life or would you be satisfied with good enough optimize i mean do i do i look like some some silicon valley tech bro asshole i mean no i i don't optimize anything um when do you go to sleep? Do you have a consistent sh sleep schedule? Or are you like me where you sleep a few hours later every time until eventually you flip your sleep schedule? Yeah, there's no consistent sleep schedule whatsoever. I can say that I am, by inclination, um, much more... I, I prefer the night. I'm nocturnal. Um, and so when I can get away with it, I like to just stay awake until... I, I suppose... If, I, if it was up to me, it would be like 7 a.m., right? Like, that would be the time I would go to sleep if I could just control whenever I went to sleep. If there were no other commitments that I had, I'd probably go to sleep at about 7, wake up at, you know, 2 or 3 um, in the afternoon. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, uh, very often things don't work out that way. So, you know, I'll get like, th I'll go to sleep at 7, sleep for 3 hours, wake up at 10 um you know sleep in the afternoon i mean there's no consistent sleep schedule at all but i do try to stay awake during the night when i can um how much do you procrastinate uh you have an important assignment due tomorrow how much anxiety uneasiness do you feel well i do procrastinate quite a bit but when it comes to deadlines i'm pretty good with that i mean i uh i don't wait until the night before i've no i don't do that i i usually get stuff done um yeah, I, I, I mean, like, I'll get, I'll get stuff done like long before it needs to be done. Uh, let's, let's put it that way. Um, so, yes, to procrastination, but I don't think I struggle with procrastination um, in the way that I. Well, look, there are some things I struggle with, but I wouldn't say. I mean, procrastination is sort of something that's kind of enjoyable for me. Um, it's something I feel like I have control over it really uh like so i can sort of enjoy it when i'm doing it you know it's like a guilty pleasure um but it doesn't really cause me any distress um and doesn't cause me any problems um nicholas giaconia i remember you saying in a q a that if you had to take a bet on consciousness it'd probably be solipsism could you elaborate on that a bit um, I don't remember saying that I would bet on solipsism, and as it happens, I wouldn't bet on it. So um, I have no memory of this, um, and therefore I can't elaborate on uh, why I said that. Um, so I mean, I don't really like. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what the motivation would have been. I, I guess what I can say is, is that you know, I I I have the ability to sort of. Uh, you know, adopt like different models of the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I can kind of adopt beliefs uh, largely sort of by choice. Um, and uh, one of the things that I will do uh, sometimes is if I'm faced with a social situation that might be awkward, for instance, is I will, you know, run through, like run in my head, I'll run through certain skeptical arguments um, and then I'll, you know, form the belief that there's no external world or that, you know, like the world is a dream or something like that. Um, I can very easily like just adopt that belief. And then, you know, when I'm faced with a, say, difficult social situation, uh, taking it that these people are actually just dream characters makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, so and then that's kind of a solipsistic conclusion, right? Like I can come to the conclusion that there's like my mind is the only mind and it has certain pragmatic benefits when I do that. Um, but then in other contexts, uh, there are no such benefits because if I'm, you know, having a meal with somebody I love, well, I want to feel like there's a connection that I'm like, there's another mind there that is reciprocating my feelings. And so in that context, um, you know, I, I put those skeptical arguments 
out of my mind and you know I just go with the uh, the sort of common sense model um, so yeah I mean one of the things that I will do is sort of you know wear different hats um, and kind of just form different beliefs in different contexts uh, and, and that seems fine but I uh, and sometimes you know I will adopt a more sort of solipsistic view of the world um, but I wouldn't say that you know that's what I would bet on if I had to like you know take a bet on on the you know the right theory of consciousness or anything like that um so you know I, I don't know I don't I don't know why I said that um do you believe that abstract objects exist such as numbers or other mathematical objects salt does crystallize in cubic structures even if there's no humans to call it a cube do I believe that abstract objects exist well so I think that um, I think that the 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 line I want to take these days is is this um, the standard way in which the problem of abstract objects is framed is that concrete objects are like taken for granted and then and then the question is well okay right <laughs> like we're taking concrete objects for granted. And now what do we say about abstract objects? That's how it's usually framed. Now, I am a constructivist about objects in general. Um, I think that we construct uh, like all of, like ordinary objects, you know, tables, chairs, hands, mountains, field legs. These are products of construction. These objects exist only relative to particular perspectives. Um, it seems to me that in the same way that we construct concrete objects, we can also construct ab abstract objects. Um, so, okay, first point, right? Um, concrete objects are utterly bizarre. There's like a hundred different problems with concrete objects. So if I take a hand, you know, perfectly everyday normal object like a hand, um, I mean, there's just tons of issues about, you know, okay, where exactly do we draw the boundary between a hand and things that are not a hand. So if I, if I look at the hand, I can say, well, you know, there's like an atom here, there's an atom here, that atom is definitely part of the hand, but then um, an atom down here is not part of the hand. But then there's this like vague boundary. Vagueness raises really vicious philosophical problems. Um, or you can imagine taking a hand and then, you know, changing it atom by atom. And if you change it atom by atom, eventually you end up with, I don't know, a scrambled egg, right? So, like, where exactly is the line between hand and scrambled egg? Again, we have this problem of vagueness, and there are vicious philosophical problems with that. Um, or something like the, uh, the problem of the many. So the problem of the many is that if you take any given um, composite object, like a hand, um, the hand is composed of trillions and trillions of, uh, of, of particles. Um, and you can... So if you take, like, some set of those particles, you take the hand and you say that it's composed of a particular set of those particles, you can draw the line in like a slightly different way. And you can say, well, you know, suppose you draw the line in such a way that it's not including this particular particle. Um, well, now you have something that's just like the hand minus one particle. Um, and obviously you can do that for, you know, trillions and trillions of particles. Um, and so what do we say? So what should we say? Do we say that there's... Um, if we say that there's one hand here then it actually looks like we're going to be committed to saying there's trillions of hands because of these trillions of different ways of drawing the lines. Um, and again, so this is another sort of, another kind of <laughs> philosophical problem um, with, uh, with, with like the boundaries of objects. Now, my, my answer to all of these sorts of philosophical problems is, well, I, I think that we draw the boundaries, right? Like human beings, um, we just... Uh, we just kind of project like concrete objects onto the world. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, like, I, I, yeah, I mean, I have this kind of constructivist line where I just want to say, uh, I mean, like independently of any given perspective, it just doesn't make sense to even talk about objects. Um, so concrete objects face, you know, a hundred philosophical problems and the you know, the line I want to take is a constructivist one. Um, now, okay, what about abstract objects? Well, I mean, 
mental abstraction is a pretty straightforward process, right? Like, so um, you can, uh, you know, you can you can look at, I don't know, a square and and then you can abstract and consider just squareness in general. And then you can think of other things that instantiate squareness in general, right? I mean, clearly that's something human beings can do. Um, so, and, and then you can then you can think about the properties of squareness in general. Um, and that doesn't seem problematic to me. Uh, so in the same way that we've constructed the square-shaped object, we similarly construct squareness. Um, in fact, I would say that they're almost, you know, from a constructivist point of view, there isn't really a fundamental difference between concrete and abstract objects. Um, because if you take, uh, you know, this point about vague boundaries or the problem of the many one way to interpret what we are doing there is abstracting so when i say like there is one hand here you can take that as a kind of abstraction um like i mean actually there's just this like mass of particles or maybe there's uh maybe we want to say that there's like trillions of hands but then you know for for various pragmatic purposes we kind of project like a single thing here and so you say, OK, there's one hand, but that's a kind of abstraction. So even when we're talking about concrete objects, I think concrete objects are already sort of abstract. Um, <clears throat> so, OK, what I would say is, is that in some sense, I, I mean, you know, do abstract objects exist? Well, I would consider myself, I mean, I'm a nominalist in the sense that I would say there are no like objective abstract objects. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not a platonist, right? Um, but I... I actually think that concrete objects and abstract objects have equal status in an important way. So, I, I mean, maybe I'm not a nominalist then, because I want to say no. I mean, both of these are perfectly legitimate products of construction. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, do abstract objects exist? I mean, yeah, in the same way that, you know, concrete objects like chairs and tables and hands exist. Um, so, you know... I, that's my view on that. <clears throat> um, you say, uh, let's imagine that there is a philosoph that there is a, a philosophical question which has an answer, but human brains are not intelligent enough to find the solution. How likely do you think we would be able to understand it if it was given to us? Let's say by AI slash aliens or other intelligent beings with different computational architectures. I mean, I just don't have any idea how to assign a probability to that. So the issue here is, all right. There's a philosophical question where presumably we understand the question, but we're not intelligent enough to find the solution. But if we heard the solution, we would be able to understand the solution, right? Like that's the that's the question we're being asked to assign a probability to. I mean, I don't know where to even begin with, like where where would, where would I get the probability from? I I don't, yeah, I don't I don't know how likely that would be. Um, and I don't even know how to start thinking about how likely, like, like where would we even begin with an investigation of what the probability of this could be? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I've heard some people talk about how an interaction between two elementary particles could be described as qualia. Any ideas related to that? Well, um, you know, so when we talk about qualia, we're talking about, you know, what it's likeness. We're talking about phenomenal properties. There's, you know, when I look at a red square, there's something it's like to see red. Um, so, okay, an interaction between two elementary particles could be described as qualia. Well, um, I mean, I, I guess my inclination is to just say I don't really see why not. I don't see why there shouldn't be qualia. Uh, so if we think that, uh, you know, if we think that there, is, that there are qualia, right, like if we want to say that you know, this is a useful way of thinking of what first person experience among, you know, normal human beings is like. So if we say that actually the way to understand the mind is in terms of qualia, then I don't really have a problem. I mean, I, I don't see any anything particularly problematic or crazy or anything about thinking that, like, maybe just everything has qualia. Um, I, I think that uh, there's no good reason to postulate non-experience um so they're just i mean like so we know that there's certain things that have experience 
Um, I mean, a, a, you know, brains, I suppose, you know, I mean, so if you're a standard physicalist, you'd say, okay, a brain has experience. And so you might well say that brains have qualia. From the first person point of view, um, there's going to be qualia. Um, there's going to be experience. Now, uh, the question then is just, well, how far does this extend, right? Um, again, so if you're adopting a sort of more standard kind of physicalist interpretation of things, then you've got a world which contains brains and it contains a bunch of other items. Um, how, like, so we know that the brains, there's like something it's like to be a brain, right? There's something it's like to be a brain on the, the, the standard physicalist model. Now, is there something it's like to be an elementary particle? Is there something it's like to be a, uh, I don't know, a rock? Well, I mean, why not? I mean, like, maybe, um, maybe. Uh, I mean, look, I can't, I can't like become an elementary particle and sort of see things from its perspective. Um, what I can do is sort of see things from the perspective of a particular lump of matter, right? So there's this, there's this stuff that my brain is made of, and that has qualia. And I know that that, like, I mean, I'm never going to like have any direct observation of non-experience, right? Like I always have to make, if I'm going to claim that there's non-experience, I always have to make an inference to that. And it doesn't seem like the, the like this notion of non-experience is really doing any empirical work whatsoever. So, you know, if I say that the, that the, uh, the, the, the elementary particle doesn't like it, it's, it's just non-experience. There's, you know, there's nothing there. Um, in terms of like experience or qualia or whatever. Well, what, but I mean, why? Like, what's that, what work is that idea doing? Um, I mean, to be clear, I suppose, you know, saying that it, that it has qualia or experience isn't really doing a lot of work either. Um, but I, I suppose there's just something where it's like, I don't see any reason to kind of postulate this, this sort of new metaphysical category. Um, uh, when we're, when we're dealing with things that aren't brains. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that that's my, my initial thought about that. Um, are you planning on exploring other schools, traditions of philosophy in the future? No, I don't really make plans for the future. I just kind of do whatever comes. I, I follow my whims in the moment. Um, do you play any instruments or do any kind of creative work? Well, you know, I, I, I can play the didgeridoo, and I used to play the didgeridoo quite a lot, but uh, I have to say that over the last few years, I mean, I've sort of stopped doing that. Well, actually, not just over the last few years, many years ago now, um, when I went to university, I stopped doing it so much just because I, I didn't have time. And, um, you know, I still feel like I don't really have time to do even one tenth of the things I want to do. Um, so I, I mean, I don't really play didgeridoo anymore, but um, I, I still can, and uh, I'd like to get back into it, but I just, yeah, I don't really have much time. Um, have you read Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom? No, I am afraid not. What is your take on psychedelics? I find them honestly fascinating. Well, I've answered that question um, a bit earlier. Somebody else asked me about that, so I'll put a little, I'll, I'll put a note to where I uh, answered that question. Also, it'd be nice seeing you in a debate of some sort, preferably a heated one. That's never going to happen. I, I I have no interest at all in heated debates, and if I ever detect that a, that a debate is becoming heated, I just check out. I, I, it doesn't, it's not me. It doesn't work for me. I have no interest in that at all. Um, Noah, what do you think of karmic ideas in Hinduism and Jainism? Um, I, I just, I see no reason to take them seriously. I, I mean, I don't really know much about them, actually. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but the, the, the very little that I know about this, it just doesn't strike me as something that... Um, connects in any useful way with any of my views or it doesn't strike and it doesn't strike me as having any like even prima facie plausibility as a view about how the world works um so uh yeah um if you believe that you have no reason to think causation exists or is true in some form or another or that it is at least a useful description then wouldn't it be nonsensical to act and expect any kind of outcome well first of all um 
I mean, I, I'm quite happy with the idea that causality is a useful description. I mean, I'm fine with that. Like, I'm happy to say that, look, we use causal language all the time. And I mean, that's because it's useful for us to do so. That, that, you know, we gain like pragmatic benefits from this language. So I'm, I'm probably happy with some sort of pragmatic account of causal language. Um, so, yeah, I mean, causality is a useful description. That's fine. Um, but I, I mean... So this idea about it being nonsensical, so you say, wouldn't it be nonsensical to act and expect any kind of outcome? Well, I think that ex expectations can often be based on just regularities. Um, so, you know, like I, I expect that um, at a certain time tomorrow morning, the sun is going to rise. And why do I expect that? Well, because I have, I, I, you know, there's been many, many days, there's been hundreds and hundreds of days where the sun has risen um, at that time in the morning. Um, and, the, you know, there's there's other reasons as well. Like, you know, maybe I endorse some, like, broader theory of the structure of the solar system or whatever. But, you know, like, just at a, a kind of brute basic level, you know, there's this regularity, and then I form an expe expectation on the basis of that regularity. Now, you know, what, what I might well say is, look, um, there's no... So when I'm when I form this expectation... That's just a matter of sort of habit. Um, there's not really any rational justification for expecting any particular outcome. So when I say that I expect the sun to rise tomorrow, there's no rational justification for that. Um, there's no rational justification for expecting the regularity to continue to hold. Um, and I actually, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm happy to sign up for that. I think that, you know, the problem of induction um, among a whole bunch of other sceptical problems is basically uh unassailable you know i um i think that those those arguments are pretty convincing um so <clears throat> so okay uh if we so you might think well you know look yeah you can form expectations on the basis of regularities but if you don't believe in causation then you're not going to have a rational justification for ex for, for these expectations um, now, I think that's right, but I think that actually causality doesn't really help um, because even if there are causal connections, well, you can just run a kind of problem of induction against those, as it were. You know, you can say, well, wh like, why expect the causal... Con so whatever causal connections you're postulating that are supposed to account for these regularities, why should those causal connections continue to hold in the future? I mean, it seems at least... Lo I mean, it's logically possible that... Any causal connection could just disappear or change in the future. Or if you frame it in terms of, you know, like there are certain laws of physics or something. Well, again, like those could just change. I mean, it's, it, that seems conceivable, right? Like I can conceive that there are different laws of physics. I can conceive that there are, uh, that the, the, that there are different types of causal connections. I can, like, I, I can always conceive that things just, you know, that fall apart, right? Um, so... So, okay, I, 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 I think that we form expectations very often on the basis of regularities. Um, regularities is, is all I need. Um, now, there is a problem of rational justification, right? What's the rational justification for those expectations? Now, I'm happy to just say there is no rational justification, right? Like, this, this, is, just, this is just what happens. There's no rational justification for it. It's just, you know certain types of beings like me, you know, in, in response to certain types of observations and experiences, form expectations. I'm happy to just do without rational justification. If you do want rational justification, I don't think that appealing to causality is going to help you. So that's what I think about that. Um, what do you think about fascism's relationship to re, relationship to a rejection of rationality and reason as put forth by Eco and Paxton? I don't know anything about Eco or Paxton. Um, do you think that sceptical positions and non-foundation-oriented belief creation, have, having beliefs without believing are justified in them, can be dangerous? If such views don't make it easier to have fascistic tendencies, what are the positions and dispositions that, that negate such tendencies? Um... So are these sorts of positions dangerous? Well, I mean, okay, I, I think that in my, so my own personal experience on this is that 
fascists don't really seem to express much sympathy with like skeptical arguments. Um, I mean, sometimes they sort of uh, they might well like uh, adopt what like a kind of skeptical mode in some sense. Um, you know, they might like apply skeptical pressure very selectively. I mean, everybody likes doing that, right? I mean, so actually everyone likes doing this, right? So everybody is happy to apply skeptical pressure selectively. Everybody can adopt skepticism and like apply skeptical pressure to uh, the beliefs that they disagree with. So, I mean, fascists will do that as well. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, so every, everybody can do that. But I mean, I, I don't know, my own personal experience here is uh, like when I've spoken to people who are... Uh, you, you know, who who are sort of fellow travelers with me. I mean, so people who are um, who tend to you know reject the idea of like justification. Um, people who are uh, you know either skeptics or um, you know maybe they're not like outright skeptics, but you know again they sort of have similar sorts of inclinations to me. I don't know. They just haven't been fascists. Like I, that's just my own experience on this. Um, I've not run any studies. It might well be the case that, yeah, maybe maybe this position has got a load of fascists uh, 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 wandering around, but I, I, like I haven't seen them. And um, I'm not sure. I mean, I just don't see any way in which it, it could like there's no kind of obvious way in which it could lead to fascism. Uh, I, I don't see how that's like what the connection is supposed to be like where like what. Where's the fascism? Where's the connection to fascism here? I'm just, I don't know. It doesn't, I'm not seeing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't, th I don't think this is really an issue. Um, uh, okay, so, yeah. I think that answers that. It's not really perhaps a very satisfying answer, but, um, I mean, look, here's the thing. Uh, I think you can, like, always kind of encounter these arguments that like certain broad epistemological views have like negative practical consequences um you know there, there was an argument i can't remember who gave it but there was an argument that empiricism for instance leads to racism um and <laughs> like i think when you actually look at the details of this uh it ends up being very implausible um and that you know, when, when we're talking about these like abstract epistemological matters, there's no obvious connection to um, these uh, uh, problematic political views. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, somebody who's a fascist, I don't think they're going to come out and say, oh, yeah, uh, there's actually just no justification for what I'm saying. Uh, like, there's no I just don't, I don't have any justification for my views. Uh, no, I mean, what they'll usually do is, again, just in my experience, Fascists will usually act as if, um, you know, rationality and justification and science and so on are on their side. Um, so, like, I mean, how many... Uh, I mean, look at all... The, so, if, when I think about, like, modern fascists, right, they really love shit like IQ science, you know, and, and, and kind of, like, they, they want to claim that, like, biological science is justifying their beliefs about racial differences and IQ differences between the races. You know, they're not coming out and saying, OK, I have this belief about, um, you know, uh, uh, IQ and race, but it's just based on nothing. I just like feel it or like, no, they're saying um, this is what the science shows. So I think that m people in general want to sort of adopt the, um, you know, when they're promoting their beliefs, they want to show that these beliefs are supported by evidence and so on. I mean, hell, even I'll do that, you know, I mean, so even even me, like somebody who is actually sort of, I, I find these sceptical arguments convincing, when I'm engaging in a kind of first order debate with somebody, where, you know, where I'm, when I'm not like necessarily thinking about epistemology, when I'm just talking about, you know, I don't know, the way the world is, like, is climate change happening, for instance, when I'm talking about is climate change happening, I'll just say, well, you know, here's the evidence for climate change, or, you know, here's a sort of, um, you know, kind of here's the, 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 the model of like how, um, you know, uh, CO2 traps radiation, um, you know, like what objections do you have to that model? Like I'll talk about um, specific empirical data or empirical models or whatever. And and that's the level at which that debate works. When we're talking about 
epistemology and justification, it's sort of a step removed. You know, I, I step outside of these inquiries and sort of look at them in a more reflective way. Um, so I think that's why I'm not seeing a necessary connection between these broad epistemological views and, um, you know, positions like fascism. <clears throat> okay. Noriak. Do you think that traditional wedding and the conservative views about relationships, where you have the same woman or man for your entire life, was a better option than what is occurring nowadays? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, let's not romanticise the past, right? I mean, even when it was uh, considered a moral ideal um, to only be with one person for your entire life, uh, even when that was the case, mo people very often failed to live up to that particular ideal. Um, and I think the... Uh, the way in which that ideal was enforced led to a hell of a lot of problems. I mean, you know, like, it's not, um, it's not, okay. I think that there are ways in which um, kind of having a monogamy norm um, can be beneficial. Um, so uh, what, what it can one reason why it can be why it can be beneficial, like, so if there's an ex, so here's the thing, if there's like a general social expectation that Number one, people form relationships, you know, at a reasonably young age. And then number two, once you form a relationship, you just remain in that relationship. If that's like the norm, if that's what tends to happen, then you're probably going to see um, less loneliness, less isolation, at least among certain parts of the population. I mean, it, I do take it to be a, a problem, or at least it seems to be a problem, that... Um, you know, there's a lot of people who, who really struggle these days to find stable relationships. And I can see that, yeah, I mean, maybe if if we had like, if we had a sort of stronger monogamy norm, and then if, uh, you know, if, if we kind of encouraged people to form relationships early enough, then m maybe, you know, by, by like their mid 20s or something, um, you know, then, then, then that would be less of a problem, right? Like if people were indeed pairing off, um, given that we have sort of about, you know, 50% men and 50% women, most of whom are straight, well, okay, yeah, you're probably going to get um, less loneliness, right? There's going to be less people who are really struggling to find relationships. Certainly finding relationships these days is hard. I can, I guess I can buy that it was probably easier in the past to find relationships. But were those relationships of higher quality? I mean, phew, there are some, there's some bad stuff that was happening in the past. I mean, there's bad stuff that happens today, but, you know, there are plenty of serious problems as a result about the way that these um, sorts of, again, it was, it was the way that these sorts of norms were, like, enforced socially um, meant that it was, you know, a lot harder for people to leave bad relationships and that's a that's really that really sucks right like if you're in a bad relationship and you there's and you can't leave you feel trapped in it for whatever reason that's awful um like i don't know if that is that is that better than just being alone um i'm not like i'm not so is being in a really terrible relationship where you feel like you can't leave um i don't know is that better than just ending up alone i'm not sure that it is so um yeah you know i i mean so one one issue here is that like I think that there are significant benefits that we do get from the fact that there's like a bit more freedom now, right? And you know we don't sort of expect people to be tied down to a single relationship. That has significant benefits. Um, another point though is that you know so so as, as I said, there is a problem, right? Like the problem is is that there is you know loneliness there's serious difficulty kind of finding stable relationships like yeah that's a problem um and i mean i know from my own experience just how hard that is um you know there was like i've i've had uh periods of my life you know where i've tried to find uh where i've like done the dating thing um and you know it's pre it's pretty awful i mean Speaking as a, as a man, the issue is that it seems kind of that there will be periods where it just seems completely hopeless, where like it just seems like no matter what you do, no matter how much effort you put in, um, you know, no matter where you go, <laughs> what people you talk to, you just can't find a date, um, you know, as 
as a woman, um, if, if you talk to a woman about it, uh, it sucks for very different reasons, but it still sucks, right? The whole dating game sucks. Um, and it seems like, I don't know, when I talk to like older people, it seems like it didn't suck anywhere near as much in the past. Like these days, it really sucks. It's awful. And I talk to, old, uh, again, like when I talk to older people, it seems, it seems like it, it wasn't anywhere near that bad. Like at least the dating part of it. Um, so, um, okay, there are, there are clearly, you know, issues, but I, I also want to say though, I'm, I'm not sure how much of this is really related to, uh, the change in values. So, you know, in other, in other words, we have this problem where people can't find stable relationships. Um, now would we fix that problem if we started to adopt more conservative values? I'm very skeptical of that because I think that what's really driving this problem, I don't think this has much to do with our values. And I don't think it has much to do with, you know, the fact that people like to have a bit of fun, right? So, you know, yeah, when somebody's maybe in their early 20s, maybe they just want to like be a bit promiscuous. Maybe they want to go and like have sex with a bunch of people. Eh, like, what's the big deal? I mean, yeah, that's fine. Like, I don't really see why that would cause any problems. Um, uh, it, you know, that doesn't stop them from settling down later, right? Um, and uh, what I think is that the reason why there are these problems with, you know, dating, I think it has much more to do, if I had to guess, I would say it has much more to do with, like, changing social structures. It has more to do with things like, you know, urbanization and, uh, you know, the impact of economic liberal policies and, you know, the, the and then the, the broader shift from interacting in person and, like, being in communities where you're interacting with people in person to interacting via technologies like, you know, computers and phones. I, I, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of things happening like there's changing economic conditions there's you know changing living situations there's general um you know there's general erosion of sort of community bonds and so on there's a whole bunch of shit that's happening that's like leading to people being more alone um and i suspect that that is what's playing the role in making in in the sort of modern troubles with uh, with dating and relationships insofar as we have troubles um so, uh, I, and, and, you know, look, changing the value. So if we decided to start adopting more conservative values, that wouldn't change any of that. OK, that's not going to that's not going to change, you know, the consequences of urbanization. Um, or if we so if we decide to be uh, to, to stop being so promiscuous or whatever, um, again, that's not going to change any of that. So um, I'm skeptical that conservative values are going to help change the problems we do face. So yeah, I think what I would say is, is that those conservative values led to some pretty significant problems in the past. I think there's a good reason why we got rid of them. And, um, and if we adopted them again now, I'm, I'm very skeptical that it would help change the problems that we do actually have. I think that's where I'm inclined to, uh, to that's what I'm inclined to say. Um, Obi Jin Kenobi, do you consider yourself a nominalist? Why or why not? Can you explain? Well, I actually already have explained. I've answered this question already. So um, I, I, who did I answer? I answered it in response to uh, the name is do, 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 Nicholas Giachona. So I will link that in the um, description. Um, you can see my answer to that there. Um, Onion. Do you consider philosophy an academic failure relative to the immense success of fields like science, uh, fields like physics or mathematics? Philosophy classes seem no different than classes about the history of philosophy. Surely there must be a way to introduce proper truth-seeking rigor into modern philosophy and stop philosophy from being the laughing stock among other academic fields. Success. The immense success of physics and mathematics. I mean, physics was pretty cool in the past. I'll give you that. Physics was good. It used to be good. Physics used to be pretty cool. I mean, you know, like when... So there was a time in physics when it was like, you know, they, they, they you know, set up a fucking little beam of light or something. And they'd say, you know, here, look at this. There's like a little bright spot in the center of this shadow that, you know, completely overturns what we thought about the nature of light. Or they'd say, you know, here, check out these photos of an eclipse that completely overturn our uh, traditional assumptions about the structure of space, time and gravity. You know, uh, like physics used to be doing that kind of thing. But like these days, I mean, 
Am I supposed to be impressed that we've like pumped 10 billion pounds and years and years of research into a particle accelerator and we've like produced some splotches on a graph that look exactly how we predicted? So confirm all of our beliefs. I mean, like, I don't know, is that impressive? That doesn't seem very impressive to me. Um, I, I, sorry, I mean, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed that you spent 10 billion pounds making some splotches on a graph that look exactly how you predicted. Uh, but um, I mean, I mean, okay, look, I mean, I'm kind of joking there. I'm half joking there. Uh, there are some impressive things about physics. Um, but I, I, I Okay, what is it that's impressive about it? Well, I take it that the what's supposed to be impressive is it it exhibits these remarkable novel predictions. So, you know, what we've done in physics is we've come up with these theories and models where we have uh, an unprecedented ability to like predict the observations of so what we're going to observe, right? So, we, and and it's in, to incredible precision. We have all sorts of novel predictions to incredible precision. Um, we also have unprecedented abilities to control phenomena now, like we can apply scientific theories in the construction of technologies um, that like give us greater control over the world. Now, um, I mean, one point is, is that I, so that is, I think, I think I would say, yeah, that, that that's impressive. I'm not actually sure whether that's, um, whether that's like good, right, in the long run. I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of negative consequences that have happened as a result of you know, technological development. So I, I, I feel somewhat ambivalent, um, I think, towards the uh, the kind of growth of science and technology. But yeah, I mean, I, I look at that and I'm like, okay, that seems pretty impressive. Um, now, philosophers obviously are not constructing theories that give us novel predictions. They're not uh, constructing theories that are applied in the creation of new technologies. Okay. But the thing is, is that I mean, that's obviously not what we're even trying to do. That's obviously not our goal. So it just seems like a very strange standard of comparison, right? Like, I mean, I mean, you can by all means criticize what philosophers are doing. I have, I have a lot of objections to um, different fields of philosophy. I, I think it's sort of inevitable though that, you know, I, I mean, I would take it that like philosophy is supposed to be sort of, um, you know, kind of stepping back from other types of inquiry and it's supposed to be like exploratory it's supposed to be kind of questioning fundamental assumptions so obviously you know any philosophical program that I, I mean but my hope would be there's going to be lots of different philosophical programs where I may well just you know really disagree very strongly with some of their fundamental assumptions so I mean yeah I, I, I can criticize philosophy but I don't think um, to me anyway I don't think it makes sense to like criticize philosophy in virtue of the fact that philosophy has failed to exhibit the sorts of successes that you find in physics, because I'm not sure that any field of philosophy is really trying to do that. Um, like, I don't know, maybe experimental philosophy? Um, I mean, I guess that's trying to be uh, more like a science. Um, you know, that's kind of modelling itself on, like, psychology and sociology. Um, so it may make sense to to criticize that for for failure failure to produce novel predictions, um, but yeah, I mean what, what most philosophers are doing um, it has just got nothing to do with um, it, you know it's just not the goal. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, what about if we compare philosophy to art? Say, um, I mean, art. I just take art to be like. I guess I would say almost intrinsically worthwhile. Now, when I say intrinsically worthwhile, obviously I'm not committing myself to objective intrinsic value, right? I just mean that to me, art doesn't need any further justification. I just take it to be like something that's worth doing. And I like, and, and like, that's it, right? It's just, you don't have to justify yourself when you create art. And when I look at, you know, art over the, uh, over the 20th century, I think there's loads of, fascinating things that have happened. Um, I mean, there's also lots of art that's terrible, obviously, but um, there's, you know, we're, 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 there's all sorts of different styles of art. Plenty of those different styles of art are interesting. Um, and obviously there's no, you know, it doesn't have like practical utility in the vast majority of cases. In the vast majority of cases, you produce the art because I don't know, you produce it for its own sake, right? It's not because you're trying to construct some sort of uh, empirical theory. Or it's not because you're trying to produce new technologies. Um, you, you know, you, 
you're just interested in creating this object of aesthetic appreciation for its own sake. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't know. I mean, I actually feel much the same way about philosophy. I think that the vast majority of philosophical questions are just interesting for their own sake. You know, when I do philosophy um, and when I, like, I think about things like, uh, you know, epistemology, I kind of reflect on like, um, you know, are, like, so for instance, are any of my beliefs justified? Um, like, is there even such a thing as justification? Uh, you know, like, if so, how do we go about justifying beliefs? Reflecting on these sorts of questions, to me, just, like, it doesn't need any further justification. It doesn't, it doesn't need any further um, uh, defense, right? It's, it, like, it's good enough just in itself, to me. Um, I mean, obviously, if you disagree with that, then... I don't know, maybe, maybe philosophy isn't for you or, uh, or maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we should, um, reform philosophy. But, um, I, all I can say is that to me, I just think philosophy is good enough as it is. Um, so that's where I stand. Um, Pacific LL. <clears throat> Suppose everything exists as in literally everything that can be thought of exists out there. What could be the philosophical consequences of this? Even from the point of view of induction a la Hume, we could not ever be certain that the world will suddenly collapse because this collapsing exists somewhere where yet would we really observe such frequent cataclysms? Well, um, I don't know if you've ever read much on modal realism. You may want to um, check out David Lewis's book On the Plurality of Worlds. Uh, I also have a series of videos on modal realism, but modal realism claims that every possible world literally exists. Uh, it exists in the same sense that the actual world exists. And for, for Lewis, um, possible worlds uh, are defined in terms of logical possibility. So any world that is logically possible, according to Lewis, really exists. So there really is a world in which you know, I don't know, like the events that you see when you watch The Lord of the Rings, right? Well, that's actually showing you what's happening in another world out there. You know, there's a world that consists of nothing but one million talking donkeys. Um, there's, you know, a world that's, uh, uh, you, you know, there, there's a world that's just like our world, except the Andromeda galaxy is one meter closer. I mean, so like every pos every way a world could be is a way that some world is on Lewis's, uh, on Lewis's theory. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, everything that can be, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's actually perhaps Lewis would say more than what can be thought of, but yeah, everything that can be thought of exists. Um, so if we suppose that, I mean, what are the philosophical consequences? Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I like <laughs> Lewis at least proposed this view because he thought that it helped him handle, um, modal claims. So on Lewis's model, when I say something like, I could have worn a blue shirt, right? What that means is, and what makes that true, is that um, there is some other possible world, just like this world, where my counterpart in that world did in fact wear a blue shirt. So Lewis thinks that, um, you know, one of the useful things that you can do with this sort of view is account for modal claims, claims about possibility and necessity. Okay. Um, now, I think that, you know, I mean, maybe there are some other, um, some other interesting consequences this sort of view might have. Um, one interesting consequence might be uh, for views like utilitarianism. So let's say that you think that the right action is whichever maximizes happiness. Um, well, if you're a modal realist, then there isn't actually anything you can do to affect the overall amount of happiness or suffering. So even if you, you know, like, um, pick up a flamethrower and just go around, like, lighting everyone on fire, um, well, I mean, obviously what we want to say is, we would want to say, well, that's really morally wrong. Like, that's really bad. And a utilitarian looking at that would say, oh, well, that's bad because that is increasing suffering, right? But actually, on Lewis's model, um, that's not the case. Uh, when you pick up a flamethrower and light everybody on fire, um, there's just as many other worlds out there where you refrain from doing that. Um, so the, so like, so basically whatever 
whatever could happen does happen in some world. Um, so, you know, you can sort of devote your life to maximizing happiness in, in this world, uh, but then that's just going to mean that in some other worlds, your counterparts are failing to maximize happiness. Your counterparts are even imposing um, you know, maximum suffering. Uh, so if you adopt this sort of view, that maybe will mean that, um, you know, there's just no longer, uh, from a utilitarian point of view, there's just, yeah, like all actions just sort of become equivalent. And that might be an interesting philosophical consequence. Um, as for this point that you raise about um, induction, well, I think that the, I, I mean, I'm not sure. So I take it that the issue here is that um, if you think that, all possible worlds exist, then there's going to be just an infinite number of worlds where, like, in the next second, um, the laws of nature just stop holding. So, like, worlds that are identical up to this point, right, but then the laws of nature just stop holding and everything collapses. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, um, that's true. And I guess the problem then would be, well, why would I expect the laws of nature to continue holding in this world, right? Like, why, why would I expect that I'm in a world where the laws of nature are stable rather than a world where the laws of nature just collapse, I guess is the question. Um, the thing is, I mean, that is a big problem, but I'm not sure that it's a problem that follows from modal realism. That just seems to be a much more general problem of induction because, like, even if you're not a modal realist, well, it's still the case that, yeah, it's totally conceivable that, like, the laws of nature are just going to stop holding. Um, like, I mean, so even if you're not a modal realist, I can, you can still ask yourself the question, well, how do I know whether the world I'm in is a world where the laws of nature are stable or a world where the laws of nature are just going to collapse? That's a, still a perfectly sensible question. And so it seems like you face the same problem, like, regardless of whether or not you think that these possibilities are actually instantiated, um, or, or are really instantiated somewhere. It seems like you're going to face the uh, the same problem, I, I would imagine. So I'm not sure if it has um, sceptical consequences with respect to induction. I think that there is just a much more general problem of induction that everybody has to face. Um, Plastic says, if you could know one thing without a doubt, what would it be and why? I mean, look, this is a lame answer, but the, honestly, it would be tomorrow's lottery numbers. I mean, like, I could really, yeah, I mean, that would be cool, right? Like, I'd like to have loads and loads of money. So uh, that's what I would know. Um, that's if I could know uh, without a doubt. Push, why is methanol called wood spirit? I'm afraid that I don't know anything about the, you know, etymology of, of the term methanol or uh, wood spirit or, or whatever. So I can't answer that question. Uh, question Quandera. What are the baseline assumptions required or the implicit constraints upon humans that must be ignored in order to do philosophy? What? So I see the point of at least many parts of philosophy as involving, you know, so like what we're doing when we do philosophy is like stepping back from particular inquiries and asking about the foundational assumptions that those inquiries are making. Um, so, you know, like when we do philosophy of science, for instance, we step back from science and we ask things like, what is the scientific method, right? And and is the method, is that method reliable? Um, like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what is the nature of uh, uh, scientific progress right like we so th these are the sorts of questions like d does science deliver knowledge so we're asking like questions about science and we're we're targeting sort of things that might well be fundamental assumptions um of of this process so you know we maybe identify what the scientific method is and then try to and then we can further ask like well is it does it have a justification is it justified um and so in general i see philosophy as like stepping back and asking these sorts of foundational questions, asking questions, and, and, and like it's questioning the assumptions that underlie particular areas of inquiry. I think a lot of philosophy is supposed to do that. Um, and so, you, you know, you sort of want to say, well, really, um, you, you know, like you shouldn't really be like just 
you shouldn't be taking... So in your role as a philosopher, you shouldn't really be taking anything for granted, right? Like you shouldn't be taking... There shouldn't be any sort of baseline assumptions. For any claim, anytime somebody makes a claim about what the assumptions are of a particular area of inquiry, you should be prepared to at least consider suspending that assumption and seeing if you can think about it in a different kind of way. Um, uh, I, I think that that's like kind of crucial for <laughs> for philosophy. So, I mean, I guess I would say, look, I mean, w one of the things it seems like we need in order to do philosophy is uh, is like language and reason um, and, and you know, we, we need to be able to like make inferences and so on. So I'm, I'm going to put this forward as a proposal about one of the assumptions that's required, right? So like if I'm doing philosophy, then, okay, I need to be able to express things using in, in propositional form. I need to be able to reason about things. I need to be able to see the connections between different propositions. But, but now I would expect that, um, you know, some other philosopher is going to challenge what I've just said and um, present some reasons why actually that is not required to do philosophy. That's not an assumption that we have to make. Um, so, uh, you, you know, I mean, and, and, and that that's what philosophy is all about. It's about like questioning these assumptions and not just making these assumptions and running with them um, uh, as I see it. So, um yeah, uh, whatever whatever the assumptions may be that are required in order to do philosophy, I think that as philosophers, we have to be open to um, to questioning them. Um, okay, um, Richard Sear. <laughs> Apologies if this is the one hundredth Chat GPT question you've gotten. I don't think I've gotten a question about Chat GPT so far. Um, but what subjects in philosophy of language, epistemology, etc., do you believe could be relevant to advancing a chatbot from something which merely mimics understanding to something which actually understands things? Um, I'm not entirely sure that that philosophy is, in fact, relevant to this, at least in any direct way. So, um, I mean, uh, so, okay. A philosophical question here would be something like, what is it that constitutes understanding? You know, I mean, so, so for example, right, you, you ask, well, um, you know, we, we want to advance it from something that mimics understanding to something which actually understands. Well, wait a minute, why are we assuming that it doesn't already understand? Like, what, like, I, I mean, what's the basis of that assumption? So, you know, like, you're presupposing that we have this thing that, that does not understand, and we want to get it so that it does understand things. Um, now, I take if we're doing philosophy, we're going to ask a question like, well, why doesn't it, why are we assuming that it doesn't already understand? What the, what do we mean by understanding? What is understanding? And so, and why doesn't this thing um, uh, instantiate understanding? That's a kind of philosophical question. Um, now, look, if we stipulate operational criteria for what understanding means, then, then there's going to be a question of, well, how do we build a machine that, um, that, that meets these criteria. Uh, and I, I mean, it's not obvious what the role of philosophy would be in that, right? So like, I might say that the operational criteria I'm using for understanding is the Turing test. And we can now ask, okay, how do we build machines that, um, that pass the Turing test? That seems like it's gonna be a problem for scientists and engineers um, rather than, I mean, again, you know, there are probably things that philosophers might be able to contribute here, but it's not directly like a philosophical issue. Um, now, the, 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 the philosophical issue here would be, um, okay, we've said that passing the Turing test is our operational criteria, but does passing the Turing test, does it constitute understanding? Um, does it you know, maybe it doesn't constitute understanding, maybe it just indicates understanding. So maybe, so like we could say that, you know, to pass the Turing test, that just is understanding. Um, or we could say that understanding is something different from passing the Turing test. Passing the Turing test measures understanding or it indicates understanding, but then we'd want to give some sort of theory of what understanding is and how it is that, you know, like or why it is that, that passing the Turing test is indicative of it. Um, or we might say that passing the Turing test actually just has very little relation to understanding. Um, like, and maybe we're just using this as a kind of pragmatic criterion or, or something like that. But, you know, like real understanding is, is something completely different. Um, okay, once we ask those sorts of questions, now we're dealing with, um, 
you know, with philosophy. Um, so uh, I think that it is plausible that when scientists and engineers are trying to build these AI, I think it's plausible that there may well be uh, contributions that philosophers can make. Now, the thing is, is that I don't really have anything to say about that because, I mean, I don't know anything about building AI. Uh, so, you know, I mean, for the people who are actually engaged in like building AI, there may be um, steps in that process where they run into certain conceptual problems where philosophy may be relevant. But you'd have to be you'd have to know a lot more about the specific the specifics of what's involved in building an, a building and an AI in order to say anything about that. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I can't. I can't comment because I don't know. Um, uh, Sai, could you shed light on the arguments between realism versus positivism in the context of acquiring scientific knowledge about things such as psychological objects? Well, the, I mean, my, um, I mean, yeah, po positivism is used in a few different ways. Um, so um, I'm, I, what I can say is, is that you know, if it's realism versus like anti-realism, well, the general motive, the general idea of anti-realism is that um, the scientific theories are tools for systematizing, predicting and controlling the observable phenomena. Now, um, obviously, I can't like, well, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, but it seems like I can't directly observe other people's mental states. Um, I observe people's behavior, but like what's going on in their minds, you know, <laughs> What's going on behind uh, behind their eyes and ears is, uh, is is sort of hidden to me. There's this veil of behavior. Um, so I suppose, you know, from an anti-realist point of view, um, psychological theories are going to um, they're going to like the goal of these theories is going to be uh, we want to predict, systematize, explain um, behavior, uh, you know, like so the the actions that people form, the language that they produce. Um, maybe we also want to be able to predict like neural states. So, I mean, at this point, obviously we, we can actually like get inside people's heads um, or maybe we not we don't always get inside people's heads, but we can put them in MR, fMRI machines and so on and um, sort of see what's going on in their heads. So like when we produce, when we propose theories that, um, that, that postulate mental states, when we propose these theories that postulate things like beliefs and desires and hopes and pains and uh, fears and other psychological objects, um, the goal of these theories is, is, is to predict uh, and control behavior and neural states. Um, now, it's, it's irrelevant to this what's like really going on inside people's heads. Um, so, you know, whether they, whether they really have, like if I have some sort of model, which delivers exactly the right predictions about a person's behavior by attributing certain beliefs and desires to them, um, well, then that's, that's, that's it, right? Like that, that, that has achieved the, uh, the goal of the, of the model from an anti-realist point of view. It's irrelevant whether or not there are really beliefs and desires in that person's head. Um, now one snag here is that, I'm undergoing mental states myself, right? So, you know, the theories that postulate beliefs and desires are tested not just against other people's observable behavior. You might take them to be tested against one's own, one's own mental states. Um, but of course, your own mental states are sort of not shareable with others, um, at least not in the same way that you can like share your, you know, well, I mean, you, you, you can, they're not going to be like publicly observable data. Um, and people who are on the more anti-realist side tend to be concerned with publicly observable data, right? Uh, so, you know, they're concerned with not what's going on in... So the point of these models is going to be to predict not what's going on in my head, but my verbal reports about what's going on in my head. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, um, but um, that... That's my answer. Um, okay, uh, secular, secular 70. Relativism faces a big dilemma. Here it is. Either a proposition is consistent with or not with other propositions. Option one. 
If a proposition is consistent with another proposition, then that means that it's simply a part of the content of a larger proposition, and hence there weren't separate propositions or perspectives to begin with, in which case they aren't multiple, and hence they aren't relative. Yeah, so I don't see any reason to accept um, that, that claim. Um, so the fact that two propositions, P and Q, are consistent, that doesn't entail that they're part of a larger proposition. I can assert P, I can assert Q, and I can assert a larger proposition, P and Q, but I don't have to. I mean, and, and the mere fact that there's like, so the mere fact that we've identified two propositions that are consistent, that doesn't mean that they're both part of some larger proposition. I, I just don't, I don't see why uh, you take it that consistency entails this, you know, like entails that these, that the consistent propositions are both part of some larger proposition. That seems very strange to me. Um, I mean, P, Q, and P and Q are three different propositions. Uh, and, and, you know, it seems like you can have P, you can have Q, or you can have P and Q. Um, but you could just have P. <laughs> you could just have Q. So, uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I don't buy, I mean, like, I don't see the issue with option one. Okay, so option, let's move on. Option two, if a proposition is not consistent with other propositions, then that means that one of them is false, in which case they are not separate truths or multiple truths, since only one of them is true, in which case they aren't relative. So, I mean, one point here is um, I, I'm not really that bothered by contradictions. I think um, the fact that, so if Two pro if a proposition is not consistent with another proposition and you were to claim that they're both true, then you would be committing yourself to a true contradiction. Um, but I'm not really that bothered by true contradictions. So, you know, like, yeah, okay, who cares? Um, but, okay, let's say you are bothered by true contradictions. Well, contradiction here is avoided by relativizing truth to perspectives. I mean, that's the whole idea of relativism is that we say, you know, so... P is true relative to perspective X, and then P is false relative to perspective Y. Right? Like that's the sort of thing that a relativist is going to say. Um, so, so P is so. Of course, we might look at that and say, oh, so you know, you're claiming that P is true and false. That's a, that's well, you know, that's a uh, that's a contradiction. But of course, the claim isn't that P is true and false. We're saying P is true relative to perspective X. P is false relative to perspective Y, and there need not be any perspective from which P is both true and false. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe you maybe you could adopt a perspective from which P is both true and false, but you don't have to, right? You could just say, okay, yeah, I mean, like, from this perspective, P is true. From this perspective, P is false. Um, and, you know, and, and, like, there's no contradiction there. Um, so uh, it would only be if you're claiming that P is both true and false from the same perspective that you have a commitment to a contradiction. And and even then, the commitment to the contradiction would only be within a given perspective. Um, you know, like other perspectives may not have the contradiction. So I, I have to say, I mean, this dilemma does not strike me as being a particularly serious problem for relativism, um, but maybe I'm, you know, missing, misun maybe I've misunderstood something. Uh, Siegbert Pseudo, have you read any Nietzsche? And if so, what do you think of him? Uh, very recently, I read uh, an article that Nietzsche wrote on truth. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was it was it was about truth, and I didn't like the article very much. It didn't seem to contain any actual arguments or anything. It, it, it I mean, in many ways, like I um, am sympathetic to the sort of view of truth that Nietzsche has, right? Like, like I, uh, you know, I'm I'm relativist, perspectivist, constructivist. It seems like that's the sort of line that Nietzsche wants to take as well but um, I'm afraid that the I, I just couldn't see uh, there wasn't a lot of interesting content there from what I read so you know I mean and, and I'm, I'm not that familiar with Nietzsche beyond that so um, yeah uh, do you believe in free will no I do not has your view on vasectomy remained the same I think that it's brilliant i love it's fantastic basically uh the way i see it is that you know i used to be diseased okay so it used to be the case that i had this contagious disease where you know like 
there, there was a risk, you know, if I was to have sex with a woman, that I, I might infect her with a parasite, which could, like, destroy my life. Okay, so, like, this, this would, it would be disastrously bad, um, potentially, if I, uh, if I transmitted this parasite to, um, to a woman. And um, I've now been fixed. Uh, the, I, I, I've been cured. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. I can say that, um, you know, I haven't had any negative side effects at all, really. Um, I was expecting a lot worse. <laughs> um, I mean, so my experience was that I think there was like some mild pain um, you know, for a few days after the operation, but like, pr I mean, pretty much it was, it was fine. I, I know that, I mean, I stayed in, I sort of, you know, stayed in bed for a few days and then I, I was very careful and slow for a couple of weeks, but it didn't take very long to recover. Um, you know, I, I didn't even have to take any paracetamol or ibuprofen, um, at least as far as I recall. I think, well, I took like, I took a couple of paracetamol like directly after the operation, but then that was about it. I, uh, so yeah. And I mean, now I'm just kind of back to normal. Um, uh, again, no side effects, everything's working great. And, and I can just <laughs> like, now there's no, there's no risk. It's a great, it's a great weight off one's shoulders. Um, like, like knowing that, that there's no more, there's no risk anymore, um, of, pregnancy um i have never wanted kids uh and you know having the having that like in the background every time you have sex or at least every time you have vaginal sex is not a pleasant feeling and, and i mean there's no way like out of it because even if you use other forms of protection they're not necessary i mean like look you can like condoms are not very reliable right like that it's just as simple as that they're just not right like condoms actually like in terms of the reliability they kind of suck um uh, even if you use them perfectly when you look at the actual rates of failure it's pretty horrifying so you know con condoms are uh yeah i mean they they, they 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 don't do a good enough job um well vasectomies are not perfect either nothing's perfect nothing can completely remove the risk but like i mean once you get a vasectomy it's like the rates of failure are like i don't know one in a thousand or something and or two thousand even and i'm i'm happy to go with that like i'm like okay fine um so yeah i'm uh, i'm very pleased with the whole thing um what do you think we you can know for certain i would say absolutely nothing i don't take myself to have any certain knowledge um uh so and in fact i mean i never really have i've I've always been very much inclined to some sort of well i've always been inclined to fallibilism right um to thinking that like in principle you know it, it like anything is kind of open to refutation anything is open to being displaced by some superior model even claims about you know like my own immediate mental states in fact, I, th I think that those are, you know, like any claim you make about yourself, I mean, like, I can very easily come up with arguments that, uh, you know, attack the notion of a self, right? So, you know, if I say something as simple as like, well, I am feeling pain, or I am seeing red. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those propositions are easily open to attack. Um, you can attack the notion of a, of a, uh, a unified self, an I, um, and then when you say something like, you know, pain or red, well, you can attack the sort of conceptual schemes that those are, um, that, that, that those uh, constructions are drawing on, you know, like when we talk about pain, there's a certain kind of folk psychological conceptual scheme that I think uh, is easily open to doubt. So, um, I mean, clearly anything that we say about, you know, the external world, I think that's open to doubt. I think that claims about one's own mental states are easily open to doubt. I think, um, you know, claims about, uh, I, I don't know, um, well, what, what else, you know, sort, sort of basic logical intuitions, like the law of non-contradiction. I mean, that's easily open to doubt. I don't even, I don't even believe that that's true. Like, it's not just open to doubt. I actively reject the law of non-contradiction. So, you know, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I would, I would say I'm, I'm pretty strongly on the fallibilist side. Um, 
with which philosopher do you share most of your views and why? Man, that, that, I mean, the why question is kind of difficult to answer. Like, I'd have to give an account of, like, all my philosophical views. <laughs> um, so, I, I don't know. I can't really... Yeah, I don't know. If, <laughs> um, but some philosophers I, I share a lot of views with. Well, I mean, obviously, David Hume. Hume is, is I guess, the big one. I consider myself uh, to be sort of... A lot of the views that I hold, I think it's basically just Hume. I mean, I see like most of my views as, as basically just Hume. I'm kind of recapitulating things that Hume already said. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, so Hume's um, sort of skeptical arguments um, and and the fact that he, he seemed to find these skeptical arguments like r rationally compelling in some sense, um, or, or at least, you know, so, so for Hume, it's like the skeptical arguments are such that they end up like undermining reason but then Hume goes on and holds beliefs anyway um in virtue of just sort of non-rational factors um and and that's kind of much the same as the sort of line that I take which is that I think that skeptical arguments um are are sort of unassailable I'm not I'm not convinced by any of the responses to many of the classic skeptical arguments but then what I say is well there's nothing problematic about just holding beliefs, right? Like so these skeptical arguments are successful in undermining justification, but um, you can just hold beliefs without justification. So, you know, um, uh, again, I, I take that to be a sort of, you know, broadly kind of Humean sort of position. And, and Hume um, as, as well, I mean, also like I, I, I like Hume's projectivist accounts of things like you know, causality and, and I suppose modality as well, you know, so Hume's projectivism concerning, you know, necessary connection and so on. I, that's the sort of view that I would also be inclined towards with respect to causality and modality. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so Hume, Hume is, is, is a big influence. Another is um, Paul Farabend, uh, he, uh, his rejection of like universal rules of um belief formation let's say um i also i suppose i share um his i i i guess i i'm i'm sympathetic as well to his like later metaphysics that he outlines in conquest of abundance um so this idea of like the world as as this kind of being is is like abundant and can be you know modeled or idealized in various different ways in our theories um, and then, you know, like the, the sort of the on, ontology of the world is something that's constructed within a model where, you know, we, we are sort of interact, it, we, the, the model is constructed in the interaction with the world and the, but the ontology is like part of this model. It's not something that's, you know, kind of just giving us like a, it's not something that's like mirroring the structure of the world itself. It's more like you know, there's this interaction between human beings and the world and then we come up with, and then these ontology, and then the ontology of the world is uh, proposed within the model. That didn't make any sense what I just said there. I'm, I'm, I've been talking for a while, so sorry. Um, but, you know, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to leave it in. Um, another one, uh, Good Nelson Goodman, I think is another um, one whose views I share, his, his relativism and constructivism. So, you know, um, yeah, so th those are some philosophers that I uh, agree with. Um, on many points. Um, what are your political views? Uh, I suppose sort of broadly kind of, I don't know, anarchist e libertarian-ish, left, somewhat, I, you know, like uh, broadly in that kind of area. Um, yeah, like a, a slightly anarchist, libertarian, lefty kind of thing. That's probably what what my political my politics are um uh have i asked too many questions uh or too few no i don't really have a preference about uh the number of questions you ask why do you remind me of kirill kirillow in dostoevsky's demons i don't know i've never read that book um stanley evans uh, do you think you are obliged to, to save a drowning child even if $5,000 of your possessions would be damaged? Um, 
I mean, I, I, I don't know, not, not, in, not in general, I don't really see that as a moral obligation. I mean, I suppose, well, I don't know, do I? I, I guess if you see a drowning child right in front of you and, uh, and it's, as in, you know, the original thought experiment, and it's perfectly safe for you to save them, then, yeah, I'd probably judge you to be a bit of a prick if you didn't, if you didn't go and save them. I mean, uh, if it's, like, relatively easy and safe for you to save the drowning child, then, uh, yeah, I'm going to judge that you're a prick if you don't save them. Um, so, uh, even, and so, yeah, maybe I should say that, um, you are obliged, uh, to do that. Um, I, I think it's worth encouraging a norm where like people help each other when they see each other in distress. So, um, I guess I would say that, um, are you, do you think you are obliged to donate $5,000 to an effective charity to save a child from malaria? Um, no. If your answers are different, why? Well, um, when something's happening right in front of you, that kind of moves you to act, right? Like, so when something's happening in front of you, that creates this like immediate emotional response. And that seems to me to be something that's worth encouraging. Um, I mean, certainly I have that emotional response. And so, you know, if I see somebody failing to, to act in the same way, I might judge that they're, that they're a bit of a prick. Um, I think that the, you know, the very, fact of proximity um, creates a personal connection, even if it's a very minor personal connection, whereas, you know, giving to a malaria fund is is like completely non-specific. There's no particular personal connection there. Um, I mean, I, and, and I just generally like, I, I, I like, look, I want to live in a world where when people see each other in immediate danger, they help out. Um, so like when you are exposed to somebody who's like in front of you, who's near you, when, you, when you're exposed to somebody who's in danger, um, you help them out. That's the sort of world I want to encourage, um, you know, but a world where people like act impartially, where people kind of give up all of their possessions, um, like in virtue of the fact that there are other people somewhere in the world who are in danger, um, mm, you know, that's not, uh, that's not really, I don't know if that's the, really the world I want to, I would want to live in. I mean, I suppose, would it be, uh, like, I mean, it does suck that there's people in the world who are dying. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, um, I don't really have such a strong sort of feeling, a strong sort of need to bring about that. Maybe if I myself was in a position where I was dying of malaria, I would judge things differently, but like, you know, I'm not, I'm in this position and, uh, I don't really want to have to give away all my wealth to charity and I don't want the people I know to have to do that either. So, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, draw like an arbitrary, a somewhat arbitrary line on the basis of like proximity. Um, so there, there we go. Um, what are your thoughts on of obligations to give and effective altruism generally? Um, well, as you can probably tell from my answers that I just gave you, I don't really give a shit about constructing moral theories. Um, I don't care. Like I'm perfectly happy to just act on the basis of, um, you know, whatever my like emotional inclinations are. And I don't feel any pressure to sort of systematize my values in the form of a moral theory. Um, and then if you force me to system, to, like if you force me into the systematization game, then I'm going to be perfectly happy to just draw, you know, more or less arbitrary lines. Um, so I suppose what I would say is that, you know, is like, are there obligations to give? I, I don't think I see things that way. Um, as for effective altruism, I mean, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, that would be, that's great. Um, for me personally, I, I don't really like giving away money. I mean, maybe that's just because I don't have much of it. Uh, like I, I don't really have a lot of money. Um, so, but I think, to be honest, even if I did have a lot of money, I don't think I would give much away. Like I'm, I'm, and, it, and if I did give stuff away, I wouldn't be engaging in effective altruism. Um, actually, no, I think I would give money away. So if I had more money, I would give money away, but I would just use it on, um, I think I would give it to like artists and stuff. Like I would probably use it for that. I can't imagine I would ever spend my money on the sort of effective altruist causes. Um, so yeah, or maybe I would, I don't know, would it be, 
I suppose it would be like people doing like weird art who are, you know, like sort of, I want to say like outsiders, you know, like maybe people who are, yeah, uh, who are in, in one way or another um, kind of outside the sort of cultural norm or, or something who, who need help. I'd probably give money um, to that uh, sort of person. Uh, like, I don't know if there was some, you know, uh, transgender kid who was living in, um, uh, you know, like the American South or, or something, um, <laughs> where I'm, I'm assuming maybe they wouldn't be uh, accepted so well. And like, let's say so, like some openly atheist, transgender 17 year old in the American South, maybe I give I give money to that sort of person, right? Um, but uh, so yeah, I, that's, that would be my inclination. And I, I don't feel any need really to even engage in the process of like justifying why I would do that. So, okay, uh, the aspiring humanist. Um, you did have a video with Majesty of Reason, but do you have a bit more in-depth thoughts perhaps on existential inertia? I think the response from atheists is satisfactory, but the argument is probably the most unique and intriguing one I've heard. I have absolutely no idea what existential inertia is. I've never heard of that before. Um, so, and, and so I looked it up actually um, after I saw your comment. I thought, well, I'll, I'll just you know check out this existential inertia thing um, to see if I, so I might have something to say about it. And it seems like in order for me to even understand the concept properly, I'd have to do a whole bunch of research. I'm not going to do that. So um, that that severely limits what I can say. Um, as far as I can tell, though, this is a claim about persistence. It's a claim about object persistence. So we're saying that there are some objects where, some concrete objects at least, where um, they, so there are concrete objects that persist without the requirement of a, uh, like, external cause that sustains their existence. Um, so without, you know, that there's no, like, sustenance or conservation from the outside um, and 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 then they these objects cease to exist only when they are caused to do so. That's the general idea. Now, if that's right, I mean, well, first of all, um, I, I mean, look, I, I I'm like a pretty like hardcore sort of constructivist. Uh, like I'm a constructivist about objects. I don't buy the idea that objects persist like metaphysically. Like there's there's these like objects kind of out there independent of us that. That, that are like persisting um, from a yeah, so from a sort of constructivist point of view I mean um, yeah I mean like we can come up with models of the world where we are modeling things such that um, we're sort of projecting these persisting objects onto the world um, and it, maybe there are models where it's useful to think of these objects as having this existential inertia so they, they persist without requiring a cause of their existence. They cease to exist only if caused to do so. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, m maybe, maybe that's how we think of um, objects. But again, I, I don't take that to be, to have any like, I don't know, metaphysical weight, as it were. Um, and I mean, also, of course, I'm uh, similarly an anti-realist about causality. You know, so, um, but yeah, I mean, basically this, this idea that like well there are persisting concrete objects um well sure i mean if you if you want to model the world as containing persisting concrete objects fine but i think you can similarly model the world such that it like either doesn't contain any objects at all or there are objects but like they never persist for more than an instant um you know like that's these are these are all um perfectly you know legitimate models of the world some of them are you know more or less pragmatically useful um but like you know the reason why i i suppose so i suppose what i would say is is that well insofar as we treat objects as having existential so insofar as we model things such that there are objects with existential inertia i would say that that's going to be cashed out just in terms of the pragmatic utility of those models um it's not that there are that there's like some independent like some world independent of our perspectives and conceptual schemes where these objects exist and have these properties. So that's my view. Um, and as for this, uh, I'm not sure, actually sure, I don't know how this whole thing relates to atheism. Um, 
I would have thought that if you think, so you say the response from atheists is satisfactory. I would have thought that if you think that objects can persist without external sustaining causes, then that that would presumably actually help atheism because um, it would presumably undercut some of those contingency arguments. Um, wouldn't it? I, d I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But uh, anyway, yeah, I don't really know anything about this. So um, you'll have to have to excuse my uh, ignorance on that topic. Um, the Piano Man. How useful is philosophy in daily life slash pragmatic living? I love philosophy, but sometimes I feel as though it's easy to get bogged down in the weeds of a particular issue. How do you balance the search for a robust worldview with practical everyday considerations? I'm not really the best person to ask this question because I just don't even uh, experience an issue like this in my own life. Like I, I, I just this doesn't manifest as a problem, right? Like I just enjoy doing philosophy, and I, I do it, or maybe I don't enjoy it actually. <laughs> like, but I, I'm certainly driven to do it. So you know, I have this drive to do it. I have a drive to do philosophy. Um, so I do it for some of the day and then in other parts of the day I do other things, you know, sometimes I'm reading philosophy and I get hungry and so I go and eat some food and then I don't really, and then I'm not doing philosophy anymore, you know, I'm just eating food. Um, I don't know, I've always found it very easy to like disengage the, the philosophy part of the brain, right? Like I can do philosophy and then I can just disengage that and go and do something else. Uh, it, it seems... That seems very straightforward. I, I, I mean, I've just never experienced a problem with that. It's, I mean, it's never got in the way of, like, my, my kind of everyday pragmatic life, right? Like, pragmatic consider. So yeah, I mean, like, and and I'm not. I mean, it's not useful either. Like, I wouldn't say that philosophy has had any real utility for my uh, everyday pragmatic life, right? They're just completely different domains. I have an interest in philosophy and. Um, I also have an interest in other things, and there's not a great deal of overlap. Um, uh, I, I mean, there are certain general tools that I've maybe got from philosophy, which, so, so you know, the way that the, the sort of methods of critical thinking, for instance, I can apply those more generally. So there the are general tools, but like, um, you know, if I'm talking about like just a, say a philosophical theory um well i'm i'm not sure that that that's something which kind of connects much with my everyday life um yeah yeah okay um what i said there isn't really true um it has a it has a huge impact on my everyday life i don't know why i said all of that um, because I'm frequently, uh, like adopting different philosophical theories for different purposes. Um, I don't know why I just said all of that. That wasn't even remotely true. I, uh, what? Yeah. See, here's the thing with me is that if you ask me anything about myself, about, you know, like what I'm like, I, I'm not reflective, right? Like I don't think a lot about, you know, what I'm doing in the moment um, and, you know, why I'm doing it and so on. Like, I tend to just act, right? And I, I, n I don't think about my past. I don't really consider my future very much either. I very much just live in the moment. And so, you know, when you ask me these questions which require me to reflect on what my life is like, I, I don't know, I just end up making stuff up. I didn't intend to make stuff up, but that was a lie, right? Well, it wasn't a lie. I didn't, I didn't lie, but what I told you was false because I said that um, philosophy hasn't had like a significant impact on my life and actually it has had an enormous impact. The, um, I mean, so one way in which it, it manifests in my life is that um, in different circumstances, um, I find that I will uh, sort of adopt different models of reality. Um, so my favorite example of this is if I'm in a social situation and things are, uh, you know, I may be feeling embarrassed or awkward or something, I can run through skeptical arguments and I can, I can like actually hold the belief that, um, 
you know, th this world, it's just not real. Like it's a dream, it's a hallucination. Like, or I can, I can, I can abandon the sort of common sense model of the world, right? Um, and so part of what allows me to do that is, well, number one, it's the fact that I find certain skeptical arguments genuinely quite compelling. And then number two, I have a sort of voluntarist conception of belief where, um, you know, it's perfectly rational to believe. So there is nothing irrational about holding beliefs without justification um, and where you can sort of choose beliefs. You can just make assumptions and choose beliefs. So um, I can choose to adopt them. And because I like really have, and like these are positions that I actually have come to, you know, it's not just, I don't just say this stuff intellectually like I really am like believe this shit and so um because of that I I can just you know adopt an alternative model of the world um when you know certain pragmatic considerations call for it um so that's one way in which uh, philosophy has had an impact on my life and the funny thing is I'd actually already pointed this out earlier in this AMA there was some other question where I I answered this but then for some reason, when I read your question, I, I went on this big spiel about how, you know, philosophy doesn't have any impact on my life. And yeah, that's just a whole load of rubbish. Um, the thing is, I, I have very poor access to, you know, what, like what I'm doing and the reasons why I'm doing it. And uh, yeah, so any, uh, I mean, who knows what I just said then might have been a load of crap as well. Um, but, you know, let's uh, move on. Um, the Glen 8. What is your opinion on arguments that are mainly focused on semantics? You just made a video on Putnam's argument against skepticism, and I couldn't help but feel the argument wasn't really addressing the problem of radical skepticism and instead just argued around it. It gives me the feeling that he must get really frustrated with radical skepticism slash metaphysical realism because he can't really prove it wrong, so the best he can do is prove it wrong on semantics. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I... You know, Putnam himself said about that argument that it took him a very long time to it it took a very long time to convince himself that the argument was right. Um, so he he says that in the uh, in the paper brains in a vat um, when he proposes his argument, he's like, yeah, this one is like this this one feels kind of sneaky, right? That's basically what he's saying. So, I mean, I think actually, uh, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think Putnam, um, Putnam, I'm not sure Putnam is the kind of person who would get really frustrated with alternative views. Like, he, he changed his mind a lot. And um, uh, in, the, in fact, he ended up endorsing a kind of metaphysical realism later in his career anyway. Like, he changed his mind about the internal realism thing. Um, so uh, I think that he probably just... You know, he'd come up with an argument and he probably found it convincing. <laughs> and uh, what I would say is that, you know, I don't really have a problem with arguments that seem to be more focused on semantics, at least not in principle. Um, I, I suppose I'm always inclined to say whenever. So whenever somebody expresses a sort of uh, rejection of a whole kind of class of of, of arguments or a whole class of style of arguments like you have done so you've kind of said like i mean you're not exactly rejecting it but you're sort of saying like yeah you know arguments focus on semantics um you know you're suspicious of them the thing that i always want to say is well look if somebody presents an argument then just tell me which premise is false or where it goes wrong in the inferential steps and if you can't tell me which premise is false you can't tell me which inferential step goes wrong then what's the issue i mean like okay so let's say we have an argument that's that's kind of semantic right like it's a semantic argument or i mean just take putnam's argument right well okay i look i don't find putnam's argument convincing either i think there's a bunch of problems with it but um but like that's the point right i think there are a bunch of problems with it i think i can tell you where it goes wrong um I, I, so i can I can identify like certain premises where I say, no, I reject this. Um, or there are going to be certain inferential steps where I'm like, no, that, that step, um, you know, that's that, that, that inference um, is not acceptable. Like I can do that. Um, or at least I think I can. Um, and so I think that's the sort of challenge. Right. And, and if, and then if you can't do that, then um, I don't think it's very convincing 
to respond to the argument by saying, oh, well, you know, this argument like instantiates a type of argument form that I just find suspicious. I mean, like, I, yeah, like what I just I'm just suspicious of semantic arguments. I mean, yeah, that's uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I so I don't really share your suspicion of semantic arguments. Um, I do think that the uh, that Putnam's argument I, I, I would I like to describe it as like philosophical sleight of hand um, is that's how it feels right like it feels like somebody's pulling a trick on me and, uh, and I don't know I mean there's no I don't I mean that's just a feeling right that's just a feeling that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the argument um, but that does that's how it feels <laughs> um, okay what's your opinion on using dishonest tactics during debates to win them using fallacies not giving the opponent benefit of the doubt etc. Is it effective for swaying public opinion on a topic to your stance or is it actually harmful? Um, well, look, I don't really know much about how to sway public opinion. I think that swaying public opinion is, you know, I mean, that's a that's a whole different ball game than what I'm doing, right? Like, I've, I, I have no particular talent in that. Um, I have never really thought about how to do that. Uh, I would say, I mean, my guess is, if I had to make a guess on this, the sorts of tactics that you're talking about there seem like they probably are quite effective. Yeah. Um, I, you know, but like, but I mean, public opinion, is it even... So, I mean, we can say that there are certain argumentative tactics that might be effective at swaying public opinion, but honestly, I'm not even sure it's a matter of argument. I mean, like, when you look at, for instance, politicians who have managed to... Um, you know, uh, a sort of gain like a lot of enthusiastic followers. You know, you look at someone like Donald Trump. Um, I'm not really sure that it actually like matters, like how Donald Trump is presenting the sort of structure of his arguments, or like so. You know, Trump is maybe using certain fallacies, right? But I, I, I don't know if that necessarily makes any difference to anything, right? Like, um. Like the, the, there are there are going to be other things that people are responsive to in Trump's performance um, beyond the sort of structure of the arguments. But you know, yes, it is plausible enough to me that um, you know using fallacies would be effective at swaying public opinion. Um, I mean, I should say a, a bit about like, look, uh, strictly speaking, um, on my, on the sort of view I hold. Uh, I find certain sceptical challenges compelling. There are certain sceptical arguments where when I think about those arguments, they they sort of move me, right, sufficiently. And the, the conclusion that I really want to draw is to say, well, there just is no such thing as justification. And one way that you might frame this view is to say that actually all inferences are fallacious. I mean... I would be kind of happy with that, right? Like, so when I say there's no justification, another way to frame it might be to say, actually, all inferences are just fallacious. Um, so, you know, there are some types of inferences I like and some types of inferences I dislike. And, uh, you know, as it happens, I mean, it, it, you know, like, uh, I don't know, appeal to popularity, say, well, that's the type of inference that I dislike. Um, modus ponens is a type of inference I like. Um, but I... I I mean, I, I don't think there's anything more to... So, str yeah, I mean, like, really? Like, there's not really... It, it's not like one of them is, like, really rational or really justified or uh, or, or, or anything along those lines. Um, as, I, as I said, as, in my view, there just is no justification. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that means that, like, what's going to count as a... as a dishonest tactic is is going to be more a matter of sort of um it's going to be a matter of like just sort of values in in the sense that yeah like okay i'm going to count something as a dishonest tactic like if it's a tactic that i uh perhaps dislike for some reason um or maybe i mean i might just have come to the conclusion that the person who's speaking is is lying uh you know but then of course um i i think it's worth bearing in mind obviously that even when you're using what would traditionally be considered perfectly acceptable um, inferential forms, uh, you, like you can be saying true things 
and you can be putting those true things in what are traditionally considered valid argument forms, um, but you could still be dishonest. Um, so like you can you can say like perfectly true propositions, and you can uh, structure those propositions in the form of a valid argument, but it might still be dishonest, and it might still be like leading people astray. Um, so that's the other thing to to bear in mind. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Um, okay then, um, Theo Camp, what's your opinion on grounding as a model of metaphysics, particularly as a way to distinguish certain ontological projects like dualism, physicalism, etc.? Is it proper for an empiricist to take something like this seriously? Um, I mean, I understand, I think, why grounding was proposed, I, it, 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 so in the case of something like physicalism, I can see that, yeah, thinking of it in terms of grounding maybe uh, is a better way of capturing what physicalists want to say. So, like, you know, if you think of something like the more traditional supervenience physicalism and we say, well, you know, what physicalism is committed to is that there's no change in mental properties without a change in physical properties. I mean, OK, but then like... Uh, it's like maybe you could have that supervenience relation, but then it, 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 it maybe that's just saying something about there being a kind of necessary correlation between these properties. Um, and that doesn't really seem to capture like what's really important. Like maybe like God has just set things up in such a way that there's this necessary correlation between these properties, but actually the properties are completely different, right? Like, I don't know, that seems plausible to me. So, okay, grounding is supposed to give us um, something a bit stronger, right, than than this than supervenience. It's it like the mental. It's the mental properties are what they are in virtue of the physical properties, not because there's this like necessary correlation. Um, but I I think so. I I get that motivation, but I'm not sure I really buy the idea that there is such a thing as grounding, right? Which is to say, I mean, when we talk about like grounding, there's so many different types of I guess, dependency relations that we can have in mind here. So, you know, I, w I can say that mental states are grounded in physical states. Or I can say uh, the solubility of salt is grounded in facts about the underlying chemical structure of salt. Um, or the fact that the car is coloured is grounded in the fact that the car is red. Or the fact that Verity is a criminal is grounded in certain fraudulent activities that Verity was engaging in. Um, or the fact that X is a triangle is grounded in the, the X's angles sum to 180 degrees. Uh, okay, so, the, the, and now there's like so many, okay, so there's all of these different kinds of relations here, all of these different sorts of dependencies. Um, and it's just, I, I don't know, I mean, it's not cl clear to me that um, that there is in fact anything that's really unifying these things. Um, now, with something like, okay, is it proper for an empiricist to take it seriously? Well, as I see it, empiricism involves a resistance to um, explanation by postulation. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is that um, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of cases where philosophers will take a certain practice or discourse and they'll try to explain the success of that practice or discourse by postulating things beyond experience of which that discourse provides true descriptions. Um, and I see empiricism as a resistance to this way of proceeding. That, I think, is, is what's like, you know, the, the kind of key aspect of the empiricist tradition. Um, now, like grounding, I think, is going to involve a lot of explanation by postulation. Um, now, I mean, of course, I, I don't think there's anything particularly problematic about ordinary language here. Like, I, I mean, I can say that, oh, well, the salt is soluble because it has a particular chemical structure. Um, so where it becomes problematic is when, you know, the metaphysicians, uh, they sort of look at that sort of claim, like, OK, the salt is soluble because of this chemical structure. The metaphysician then looks at this claim and then and various other claims like it and then seeks to like explain this dependency this dependency by like postulating some metaphysical relation um, between you know this metaphysical relation between like solubility and the underlying chemical structure and then that's supposed to 
explain these things. And that's something I think an empiricist is definitely going to reject. Yes. Um, well, I mean, maybe not definitely. I mean, there's a lot of variety among empiricists, but I would have thought that, yeah, empiricists are probably going to be pretty, uh, pretty cautious of this, uh, of this notion. Um, understand, do you believe in God? No, I do not. Uh, Vlasius. <clears throat> Thoughts on never coming into contact with intelligent alien life, whether biological or pertaining to the universe. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I don't really care if that's the case. Um, it would be very interesting to discover alien life. Um, especially if it's intelligent. I mean, it would be actually quite fascinating to find some intelligent aliens out there and to be able to have conversations with them or maybe not have conversations with them. Who knows? Maybe we wouldn't be able to understand their language. But, you know, I mean, it would be, yeah, it would be fascinating to discover that. But if we don't discover it, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not really that worried about never coming into contact with intelligent alien life. Um, you know, if I, <clears throat> if I had to guess on this, um, I mean, look, my my feeling, my intuition is that the universe is probably almost completely empty of life, um, that there's maybe no other. So, again, this is just a feeling. This is, I don't have any grounds for this whatsoever. I'm just telling you my 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 sort of I don't know why. Right. I'm, I just have this inclination um, for some reason. I'm inclined to say that that intelligent life is probably extremely rare. I mean, like maybe like we're the only intelligent life in the whole observable universe. Um, but I, I'd be inclined to, if like if I had to bet for some reason, I would bet on intelligence being extremely rare. Um, so I, my guess is that we actually will never come into contact with intelligent alien life. That's my guess. And I'm not bothered by that. I'm perfectly happy with that. Even though I recognise it would be kind of cool if we did come into contact with intelligent alien, that would be cool. But I'm perfectly happy with it with that never happening. <clears throat> but again, um, yeah, I don't really have like a justification for. Um, I mean, even by even by my standards, like I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, I never really have justification. But like even by my standards, I would say like my take on intelligent life isn't like based on anything. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. Uh, it's just a feeling. For some reason, I have this feeling that the universe is uh, is is empty of um, other beings like us. Um, YZYSZN. Have you thought any more about modal anti-realism? Do you still consider it tenable? Well, I haven't changed my mind since I made that video. I, I mean, it's only a few months ago that I made the video on um, modal anti-realism, and um, yeah, I mean that's that's still my view uh it's a view that i've held for quite a long time actually like i'm i'm very much uh, a humian um and you know like the the modal anti-realism kind of is it's 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 something that like sort of follows from uh i, I suppose my like humian or empiricist sort of commitments um that i've held for a very long time um so yeah i do still consider it perfectly tenable um Zob Dreisestig. What do you consider to be the most overrated and underrated topics in philosophy? Um, well, it depends on what sense. I mean, so one way we might think about things being overrated or underrated is in terms of the attention that they get. So, like, I might say that something is um, overrated because it gets too much attention, underrated because it doesn't get enough attention. And if we mean over if that's what we mean by overrated i'm uh, and underrated then i'm not sure i mean so with with overrated so in the sense of like what philosophical topics get too much attention yeah i'm really not sure uh because i don't really have a problem with people pursuing things that i'm not interested in right so you know even if there's like large numbers of people focusing on something that just seems pointless to me i'm fine with that that's cool um I'm happy for philosophers to just like get on with their own things and pursue their interests, even if they're not my interests. I mean, you know, I might maybe have an issue with like some philosophical methods. I think that what I, I would like to see less reliance on common sense uh, in philosophy. I think like, you know, so things like 
um, Morian arguments and phenomenal conservatism and so on, like these approaches to philosophy that seem to uh, kind of favour common sense. I, I kind of want to see less of that um, and a bit more like radical thinking. Um, so maybe I would say that the appreciation that philosophers have for common sense is overrated, but that's not really a topic, right? That's not, that's just like a way of approaching philosophy. Um, as for underrated, so which topics maybe deserve a bit more attention? You know, I uploaded a video very recently called What is Reality? And I was surprised to find that there's very little literature on that question. Like, I mean, I mean, maybe there's a good reason why. Maybe there's just not that much to say about it. Um, but it seems kind of weird, right? Like, you'd think that, you'd think that there would be more... Uh, I mean, it, that seems like one of the kind of most basic questions you could ask is, okay, well, wait a minute, what, like, what even is reality? Um, you know, we're having all these debates about whether or not certain things are real. What, what is it for something to be real? Um, like, you'd think that that would have received a bit more attention, but actually, um, I don't know, with, with that video, uh, I, I, I didn't have a lot to draw on. Um, and so th maybe that could be a topic that's underrated. Maybe more philosophers should think a little bit about that. Um, okay, so yeah, one way we could understand overrated and underrated is in terms of the amount of attention something gets. So another way we could understand it is in terms of like how, uh, how plausible a particular view is taken to be. So something is overrated if a lot of philosophers take it to be plausible when it actually is implausible. Um, and underrated if it's, you know, vice versa. Uh, so in that sense, I would say overrated. Um, well, I mean, physicalism, I mean, is probably a bit overrated. I think physicalism has got almost nothing going for it in terms of like the arguments for it. It, it, it doesn't seem very well supported. And in fact, it seems barely even coherent. It's not really clear how to even... Uh, uh, like define physicalism as a coherent position. I mean, you know, look, there's lots of very clever work that's been done on this. I, uh, I'm not denying that, but I think it's, I, I, I find it a little bit puzzling that it's taken, that, that it's managed to sort of achieve such a, a broad consensus. Um, so um, yeah, I'd maybe say that is overrated. Um, I think that the companions and guilt argument in metaethics is overrated. I think that's actually a terrible argument um, in many for many reasons, um, but that's taken very seriously. That's sort of all the rage at the moment. I mean, I suppose it's fair enough, really. You know, like um, in uh, like I don't know, ten twenty years ago, uh, the evolutionary debunking argument was taken very seriously in meta ethics, um, and that was a more anti real. So that's like the anti realists. Right, the anti-realist argument, the anti-realist evolutionary debunking argument, that was all the rage for a while. And it's not that great. It's not a great argument, that. So now it's it's the realist's turn. They've got their shitty argument that's, that's, that's all the rage. Um, but um, no, I think that that is, is one of the worst arguments um, that's like taken seriously by a lot of philosophers. So uh, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe companions in guilt arguments should not be taken so seriously. And I suppose actually, oh, Morian arguments as well. Like, um, those are terrible. Um, and as for underrated, in the sense that, so in this sense, it would be a position that is uh, more plausible than it is usually taken to be. Um, well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a relativist. Like, I'm a relativist about truth and justification and so on. So I, like, I'm, a, I'm like a hardcore just straight up relativist. Um, and nobody really takes that position seriously. So I guess I have to say that's the one that's, uh, that's underrated. Um, like, uh, I think that's, I think that's definitely my most unpopular position. Um, at least when I looked at the recent Phil papers, uh, survey. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, those are some of my answers. Um, Woden Burns, can you give some recommendations about philosophy of law? What should I read? Which authors need I know? And one last thing, which which theme to choose for my first article on this theme? Well, I'm afraid that I do not know anything about philosophy of law.
I've never done any philosophy of law at all. So you're asking the wrong person here, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, you might want to check out Reddit's Ask Philosophy sub. Uh, they, they have, they can be quite helpful. Um, so if you have like general questions about philosophy, you know, and, you know, reading recommendations, stuff like that, um, maybe ask there, but I'm sorry, I, I actually just can't help you with philosophy of law. Um, Z Reality HD, what are your favorite music albums? Um, well, my favorite, I mean, my favorite artists, I, I mean, I have so many favorite albums. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know where to start. But like, I can say that my favorite artists, broadly speaking, um, first of all, John Cage, he's, he's number one, he's got the number one spot, John Cage. Um, I'm particularly, I mean, I love every, I mean, I love pretty much everything by Cage, um, um, particularly from like the 1950s onwards. But I uh, especially love his later number pieces. So you know, I don't know exactly what my favorite albums would be, but uh, the, you know, anything, any of the albums that are performances of his later number pieces are going to be up there. Um, Frank Zappa is uh, another favorite of mine. Um, so his album Civilization Phase 3, I suppose, would be my my top choice from him. Um, then some other stuff, I mean, you know, well, yeah, who am I into? Um I, I really love uh, Bob Dylan, um, Captain Beefheart, uh, James Tenney, Jacob Ullman, uh, Laurie Anderson, Motorhead, Steve Reich, Derek Bailey, Evan Parker. Uh, yeah, so, okay, I, I listen to... Um, I like a lot of free jazz. I like a lot of modern classical. Um, I like sort of... I, I like a lot of, like, 80s kind of stuff, like stuff that has, like, 80s production um uh so kind of i mean 80s pop rock is is great but like i i love the sort of sound of of like 80s music like you know that 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 very sort of slick production and um kind of like gated reverb on the drums and things like that um so uh yeah uh, <laughs> that's that's some of the stuff i like um so yeah okay some some favorite you asked for some specific albums so um let's say um David Bowie, Earthling, um, Earth 2, special low frequency version, uh, Steely Dan, Gaucho, um, Sonny Sharrock, Monkey Pocky Boo, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's hard to come up with stuff in the moment, there's loads of stuff, I don't know why I'm having such difficulty, because uh, I listen to, I love music, um, but for some reason it's like hard to think off the top of one's head. Um, about, I don't know, albums and, and things. It's hard. Yeah, I, I, I used to have a much better memory for this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, anyway, uh, Lou Reed and Metallica's Lulu. Um, there you go. There's a controversial choice. Uh, when that album came out, um, it was over 10 years ago. When that album came out, everybody hated it, right? And, you know, I listened to it and I thought, this album is a masterpiece. And I said back then, I said, look, in 10 years everybody's going to look back on this and it'll be a cult classic and, and people will recognize that it was, it, was it, it had an unfair reception. Like people will look back on this and they'll say it's a masterpiece. Well, 10 years has gone by and everybody still hates Lulu. And everybody's still wrong because it, it is a fucking masterpiece. Um, and so that's, that's very high up in my list. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, dude. Like, I I, I love a lot of music, uh, and that maybe gives you some sense of my tastes. Um, but I'll um, I'll leave that there. <laughs> okay, uh, that's all.